Thank you, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Um, being the first talk after lunch, I'll try and just get going. I'm sure we'll have people filtering in. Um, I'm going to talk to you about Organovo today. I think many of you know the background. It's a, it's a short talk time format, so I won't go too deeply into our background or technology, but um, we are the premier 3D bioprinting effort in the world, we believe. Um, we've been uh, uh, around for about seven or eight years now, um, started up here in San Diego, and uh, we're local, uh, about two miles from here. Um, we uh, started from the work of a, a bio biophysics professor from the University of Missouri, and we've built our own IP and additional capabilities around that initial work. Um, and uh, what we've mainly focused on today is, of course, the creation of fully human, fully cellular tissues and putting them into in vivo and in vitro um, research applications. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what we're doing today. We are a public company. We're traded on the New York Stock Exchange, MKT. And so I do have to make forward-looking statements and draw your attention to our filings. Uh, note that my forward-looking statements uh, are forward-looking statements and that uh, when you look at our finances, please review this slide. Okay, so highlights for Organovo. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the background. I want to jump ahead a little bit here and talk about, uh, because of the brief time format, our key aspects of the company and what we focus on today. So I mentioned you can branch that in two ways. The first would be in vitro applications and the second would be in vivo applications. When you think about how we apply our technology, think about the starting point not necessarily as 3D bioprinting, um, because that's a broad, that's our t underlying technology, but really focus on the fact that we can create these 100% cellular tissues, and you can have an aspect of human tissue outside the body. Our goal as we do the bioprinting is, of course, to replicate the normal tissue architecture and function as closely as possible. Now, if you can do that, how do you apply that capability and what markets do you work? And we work in, as I said, in vitro and in vivo on these. In, in the in vitro market, we have a commercial business that exists today focused on the pharma customer, a deep-pocketed customer with an unmet need, their inability to be fully predictive of drugs that are in the pipeline, and the resulting large number of clinical and even post-marketing failures that result from that. So we've built a first franchise in preclinical safety where we have a launched 3D liver tissue, which is the first line here, the first row, uh, launched 3D liver tissue that is um, working to be the most predictive model in, in, the, in the space. And it takes advantage or it, it can capitalize on the unmet need and the gaps in existing 2D and animal models out there. So I don't know how many people are familiar with the, with the space, but I'll give you a, a brief primer. In liver, which is one of the major tissues studied in preclinical safety for drugs, um, hepatocytes in 2D culture um, last about 48 hours and they completely lose their liver phenotype. And so we have the opportunity because of that gap and because of the natural gap in species between animal and human that there's a large predictive gap there that we can help fill. Um, we work in this market. It's about uh, projected to be a $1.3 billion potential market. Realistically, of course, um, you have to penetrate that market at some level. And what we've said is that we, can, we believe we can get to about um, 10 million in the, in the tens of millions of dollars in annual revenue quite quickly, and that that market individually for each tissue has 100 million plus potential for both liver and kidney tissues. Um, we're on track towards that in the liver um, where we launched last year in November. Um, we disclosed in June of this year that between the launch time in November and the June date that we disclosed this on, we had about two million in contracts signed up. The model that we follow is a service model. So pharma companies send the drugs to Organovo here in San Diego. We expose the liver tissues that we build to the drug and then we give them a profile on how it looks. And it can be anything from a very basic look at albumin and ATP as surrogates for survival of the cells um, to a very deep um, uh, set of histological results that they can look at and actually understand the pathology of what their drug might be doing. Um, the, to follow on uh, will be kidney. We'll have that in the same, in the same franchise. Um, that will launch, we expect, uh, by September of next year. We're on track towards that with a kidney model that we've been building. In kidney, the unmet need is even more dire um, because there's no really trusted 
in vitro model for kidney. Um, taking kidney cells and putting them in a 2D monolayer culture doesn't give predictive results, so it's not relied upon by pharma and not generally used. They rely on the in vivo use of animals. So again, you're back with the species gap, and we can be better there. Um, we do anticipate that our pricing can be superior in that space for that reason specifically. We also leverage these tissues that we're building in vitro as efficacy models. So think about the, we're talking about preclinical safety in the first launch franchise. In this case, for efficacy models, we're talking about essentially using these tissues as disease models to displace the reliance on animal models. It's a high content assay that we're building. It's a high content system. So you're using it at the last step of pharma. So you're using it af after you've identified hits, selection and optimization of leads at the last moment. We want to be present when you're making a decision to take a molecule to IND. Um, and then finally, in vivo, developing therapeutic tissues. So this is a bioprinted tissue that would be taken forward through clinical trials and used for a specific medical condition. And we do spend about 10% of our R&D. We're in early preclinical animal research on that. What we've said is that our goal is to have one or more of those programs fully announced and, and described uh, with a timeline by the end of calendar year 2016. We're on track for that. We have early indications of, of efficacy in some of our key areas that we're looking at. We haven't disclosed what those areas are, but I can give you a general idea. We're not talking about full organ transplants here. We're not going to build a full liver, but we're talking about large sections of liver tissue that can perhaps deliver 10 to 15 percent kidney function of the, over, I'm sorry, of the overall liver function to an individual. Many people on the liver transplant list, for example, are at that level of, of failure. They're at, at the 15 percent remaining function when they start to need, um, and there are, to need a transplant. Um, so you can perhaps forestall their need by a year by delivering a tissue like that. Um, in addition, you have a whole set of people who can't even get on the liver transplant list due to age or comorbidity. Those people could benefit from having something built for them as well. Liver is one example. Um, blood vessels, nerve grafts, heart muscle patches are other things we've talked about as potential things that we would move to take forward. Uh, again, I don't have time to talk about what we do as the process, but I can tell you um, it's, it's quite robust and we've used it on a large number of tissues. We've built what we consider to be a very strong IP portfolio. Uh, essentially, we build a number of barriers uh, to, to uh, in bioprinting, starting with the, the platform, the instrument itself, the methods, and the basic characteristics of tissue. Um, and then, of course, as we move into each tissue area, we build higher walls, making claims. We've been, for example, the first to enable the uh, creation of a fully cellular vascular tube, for example, which gave us clear IP, and that's issued in many in many areas already. Um, liver, similarly, the first fully cellular liver tissue that has the relevant cells, um, and so you make claims around that. Those are not yet issued, but we're pend they're pending. Um, I won't go too more into the IP, but I can say in terms of differentiation of us versus other companies, if any of you out there are looking at uh, academic bioprinting efforts or other companies that are starting to enter the space in terms of bioprinting, I would strongly encourage you to do very good due diligence um, on your IP in terms of how, and come talk to us. Um, we did start with the second um, bioprinting patent suite that came out of Missouri. That was in 2004 it started. Um, we also exclusively licensed the first bioprinting patent suite that came out of Clemson University. Um, so we've built from there and we feel we're in a very good position and have an early lead here. Um, because of that, in part, we've built a great set of customers and partners who we work with. Uh, I mentioned uh, the disease modeling, and this is a big part of the work with partners. So for example, we have a multiple tissue, multiple year deal with Merck to build tissue in multiple areas for their screening purposes in disease modeling. We haven't disclosed the specific areas there. Um, we have a deal with L'Oreal where it's a, a, a very nice partnership that's evolved over time. We initially started building um, prototype 3D skin models with them. That evolved into the point where we're now validating skin models together to be used in their screening. Um, the results of that work then would be to, to look for cosmetic agents with activity and, safe, the activity and safety of cosmetic agents. And baked into that later phase deal, there's not only, of course, the payment to Organovo for the prov provision of tissues for ongoing screening, but um, of course, the opportunity then for a royalty should an a compound that's active be identified and put into their consumer products. So that's a very nice um, evolved deal. That's one of our most advanced deals. Um, we work with a number of other centers. 
Um, as, and I'll point out another one key one here would be the Knight Cancer Institute. A lot of our cancer modeling work, which I don't have time to go into today, but encourage you to look at um, where we build 3D tumor models uh, in breast cancer, for example. A lot of that work is done with the Knight Cancer Institute with bioprinting capability on site there that we've trained them in and keep close in working with them on. Um, this is just a quick overview of the areas we work in. Uh, I will give you, a, I think, a little bit of a rundown in how the liver compares because I think this is the proof of what we're able to achieve. So if you look at um, the liver tissue that we built, and this is starting in 2012, and we were able to show a lot of this uh, initial work by the end of 2013 into 2014, um, was the performance of the tissue. And, it, and it, again, it closes that gap between the highly relied upon 2D hepatocytes model and monolayer culture. The liver enzymes are poorly conserved in that model. We've been able to achieve a very well conserved set of liver enzymes enzymes that, are, that persist over time. So I mentioned that the liver hepatocytes are going to lose their function on a dish within 48 hours. Um, they're basically acting like fibroblasts. Um, we actually have conservation of function and activity in the steady state tissue still at 42 days. That's not the end of this tissue. It's happy. It's going on. That's just the longest study we've run to date. Thru through that time, it also uh, shows biosynthesis of cholesterol, which is characteristic liver function in the body. Um, you don't see that typically in 2D hepatocytes. In addition, we've undertaken to test a number of known DILI drug failures, so drug-induced liver injuries called DILI in the space. And so there are known failures. Obviously, we've seen a large number of phase three and later stage post-marketing failures over time. So we have to undertake to validate this by testing those compounds. We've done that with a number of them now and shown very tight correlation with the eventual clinical data that was seen. So again, triglitazone was a classic example. No toxicity seen in 2D hepatocytes and rat models. It was taken into human studies. In post-marketing, it was actually shown to cause acute liver failure in one in a thousand diabetic patients is who it was in. Um, Pfizer paid $750 million to settle the court costs that came out of that because there were deaths. And, um, and of course, that they had spent, well, they acquired it, but others had spent up to a billion dollars developing that drug. We were able to show that drug is clearly toxic relative to a comparator compound in seven days in our system. Very clearly, because of the conservation of the full enzyme profile and the duration of action that we can get or the duration of the tissue that we can keep. We also undertook with Roche to test a compound we have to call toxic compound X, and I'll show you that slide next, which also matched, and then methotrexate, where we've where we've seen outside parties, a third party at a, at a research preclinical center, a research institute known for preclinical safety studies, has shown a very tight correlation between a methotrexate fibrosis model, um, which you can't see fibrosis in animals or 2D hepatocytes. This is the Roche data, and I'll just draw your attention on the right there to, um, to, the, to the chart. Uh, the red bars are the compound that, that um, it was presented to us in a, in a blinded fashion. We didn't know the compound, um, and we were able to show that it was toxic at a clinically relevant dose, a very low dose, and you can see a known non-toxic compound in the, same, um, in the same space that is still used today in patients um, is only starting to show an LD50 at, at about 100x the dose. So our system is selective and specific for toxicity in these types of drugs. Kidney, as I mentioned, will be next year, and I just want to leave you talking a little bit about um, about the opportunity longer term that this creates. So um, as we advance each tissue, um, it gives the opportunity to take it to the next level. So as you invest in liver, for example, show the fibrosis model that I mentioned was demonstrated with methotrexate, chronic methotrexate exposure over weeks, and the results are shown here. You can see the histology um, shows the, the classic fibrosis patterns there, which established this model. We can now take that and then build a disease model from that for fibrosis. So again, methotrexate, about 20% of patients who are on methotrexate develop this problem. Can a therapy be found? to ameliorate that problem for them. We now have a, an in vitro model to start screening and doing that kind of work. You can also contemplate building a NASH model for fatty liver disease. We do see that profile. And, and the cholesterol, as I mentioned, is conserved in our system. So this, this is the kind of thing we can build. We will do the same with kidney and other tissues over time as we reach the, the full healthy tissue. Thank you for your time. I do have to wrap it up here, but I appreciate it. And a number of Organovo employees and folks are around uh, at the conference. I encourage you to reach any one of us if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you.